Galileo Galilei had a training as in, in what we would today call the liberal arts. And in fact, he even studied at a school for drawing. Now, when he observed his first observations with the telescope of the moon, he was seeing various things and he started drawing that. But it was his drawing ability and his understanding of light and shadow that led him to understand what he was seeing. You see, he was seeing that it looked as if there were some blemishes on the surface of the moon. But because he understood how light and shadows work, he understood that what that means is that he sees that the surface of the moon is rugged. And he even then tried to estimate the heights of some mountains on the surface of the moon and that there are craters there and so on. At the same time, another astronomer, Harriot in England, also looked at the moon through a telescope. And if you look at what he had, it's just like, you know, squiggles on, on the paper. He, he couldn't quite figure out what that was. So Galileo's training as an artist helped him understand the science in this case. So this was a perfect example how the science and the art fed into each other. Greetings and a warm welcome back to Intersections. Our aspiration at Intersections is to expand and deepen our knowledge, our understanding, our inspiration from what is life, what are the various facets and pathways in life that can allow us to live up to our fullest potential. And in that regard, you know, today's conversation to me is very fulfilling and rewarding because it uh, breaks new ground, breaks new ground for Intersections in that we are tapping into the expertise, the lived experiences, the expositions and thinking of a wonderful, wonderful exemplar of this idea of dissolving boundaries. And this is Dr. Mario Livio, who is in so many ways an institution unto himself. He is an internationally known and award-winning astrophysicist, the best-selling author of a number of science books and a very popular speaker a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, has published over 500 scientific articles and made very significant theoretical contributions to topics ranging from cosmology and supernova explosions and black holes and to the emergence of life in the universe. What is also unique and distinctive is how Dr. Livio has in fact wanted to also bring into popular understanding some of these advanced and deep and profound ideas in science. So he has written a number of best-selling books, including The Golden Ratio, Is God a Mathematician? Brilliant Blunders, Why? What Makes Us Curious? And his latest contribution, Galileo and the Science Deniers. He is a science advisor to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, you wouldn't have expected that kind of a fusion between an astrophysicist and a symphony orchestra, but it exists. And there he has presented science-related topics in a number of their concerts. He's also collaborated with the composer Paola Prestini in the creation of the Hubble Cantata, which is a beautiful piece of music that includes within it a short virtual reality film as well, inspired by Hubble images and discoveries, pushing, therefore, the boundaries of arts and science. I'm delighted, honored, thrilled to have in our midst Dr. Livio. Thanks so much for joining us and welcome to our show. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. Just a, a tiny correction. I'm no longer the science advisor to the Baltimore Symphony, but I was for several years. I see, I see. Thank you for sharing that. Some of the ideas that you offer in your book, Why? And you, you speak there about how, you know, we, we live in a world that celebrates, you know, specialization, you know, having people kind of figure out their path and then stay very kind of like true to it in a kind of narrow cast way. And, and yet there are examples of people who have spanned so many different disciplines at the same time, who have a hunger and a curiosity to know more than just any one discipline could help, uh, help them fulfill. And many of these people have become some of the most uh, prolific contributors to the advancement of human understanding and creativity in so many disciplines. 
could you talk about sort of why you felt it was important for us to learn and study and understand curiosity in a formal way yes uh so there are, there are many reasons but let me concentrate on a few which were most important for me first of all i've always been a very curious person myself extremely curious this is i'm talking since childhood and at one point i became curious about curiosity itself i i wanted to know what you know is known about curiosity how it operates why we are curious and so on so i i spent you see this is not my field i'm an astrophysicist i'm neither a psychologist nor a neuroscientist so i i didn't know that much about this so i spent about 5 years trying to read you know almost uh, well i wouldn't say all articles about curiosity uh, about research on curiosity but many of those uh, i met with a uh, scientist who do research on curiosity again both on the psychology side and on the neuroscience side i interviewed many of those uh, i visited some labs that do experiments on curiosity and you know I, at the end i wrote this book which i realized was written in some sense by an outsider but at least i hope that by bringing in the perspective of an outsider who is not focused on a very particular topic and so on i i hope that i made a certain contribution to to this field now so this was the main reason that drove me towards writing uh, that book but i was also very intrigued by uh, some work done by a famous psychologist mihai chiksent mihai from the university of chicago uh, who uh, interviewed about a hundred or so uh, people whom he regarded as having been very creative uh, and this is across many many disciplines but extraordinarily creative and the one thing that he found in common to these people if there was one thing that really crossed all all you know along all these wide range of people it was that they all extremely curious so his conclusion was that a very strong curiosity uh, is a necessary apparently even if not sufficient condition for creativity and that in a way makes sense too because being very creative often means that people are able to borrow ideas from one discipline and use them in another and so on in interesting ways but being able to do that means that these people were to begin with curious enough to know about many things in these different disciplines so again this was a, a reason for me to get interested in this topic you know my uh, one of the areas of my interest has been intuition how is it that we can access um you know breakthrough insights and ideas more from deep dives to the very core of our being you know and tapping our intuition rather than purely an analytical approach on the outside what do you see as the relationship between creativity and intuition and you know has intuition played you know in your own career and life uh, a role at all in helping you advance understanding of the areas in which you have contributed you know scientific um, research absolutely intuition is uh, is you know a very strong contributor to science in general yes i mean you know people have to decide where to put most of the effort in their research especially you know i'm a theorist i'm a theoretical astrophysicist so in theory you know astrophysics is a very broad field my feeling has always been you know that one should look at the uh, where the real problems are you know and try to see if one can do something to try to solve those and uh, intuition there plays a very important role i mean you know your intuition guides you in a way towards uh you know what may be a path it doesn't mean that it will always work but you know at least it gives some guidance now again intuition if you think of intuition intuition doesn't come out of thin air i mean <laughs> you have to know something right and intuition again would be very much helped by your curiosity because if you know about many things even you know sort of subconsciously in a way 
you get this idea, aha, maybe I should go this way rather than that way. And that, even without you knowing it, derives from things that you have acquired through your curiosity. So I, I, I believe that, again, curiosity is, a, is also a necessary tool for uh, successful intuition. I mean, you know, if your intuition always fails, then it's not such a good tool. But for successful intuition, presumably your intuition doesn't always lead you to, to the right answer, but one would hope that occasionally it leads you to the right answer. It's something that for those of us who are very analytical thinkers, you know, requires uh, for us to step back from that, isn't it? And develop a level of non-attachment <laughs> so that we can be uh, open to a more non-linear kind of process of discovery that may sometimes yield a eureka moment, but then also not yield anything for a period of time that we can't control. Indeed. Uh, you see, uh, in my book, for example, Brilliant Blunders, okay, I, I took five giant scientists, you know, people like of Darwin and Einstein and so on, and analyzed a particular blunder that they have done uh, in their work. But you see, I called the book brilliant blunders <laughs> and not silly blunders uh, in the sense that I'm talking about blunders that come not from uh, being uh, completely sloppy or not thoughtful enough or doing something uh, where you actually require guidance, but you don't get it and so on. But rather, when people try to think outside the box, what we call, well, you know, Guess what? When you think outside the box, you may make a mistake. But without thinking out of the box, you may miss on certain breakthroughs uh, that could have come from thinking outside the box. Now, you know, there have been in the history of science people who constantly think outside the box. That's not, not a good idea either. I mean, there is a lot to be said by about incremental progress. You know, you have to rely on what is known and try to make a small step to advance it and so on. But every now and then, it's a good idea to try to think outside the mainstream and see, you know, where that leads you. I believe that you have some mathematical background. So, you, you know, if you are at, at some sort of minimum and you want to get out of that, Sometimes uh, an infinitesimal shift will not get you out. You need what is called a finite amplitude perturbation to get you out. So, you know, to get out of that minimum where you are. So basically, that, that's the kind of brilliant blunders that I'm talking about. Beautiful, beautiful. This is the book that Dr. Livio is talking about. A really a wonderful journey into, uh, as you said, the, um, you know, the questing from some of these, you know, like major forces in the field of science, you know, as you've said, Darwin, Einstein, and beyond, uh, and yet the struggles they faced with uh, seeking to push, you know, push the envelope, be out, be out outside the box, and um, you know, ar arrive at the uh, kind of like the perfect solutions and answers they were looking for. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Livio, but one other reason you call them brilliant uh, blunders is, at least from my reading of some of these uh, chapters, is that um, while they may have actually failed in coming up with accurate sort of models in some of these um, pursuits, they actually did help to advance scientific understanding and thinking in some intermediate way, which then others were able to then correct and improve on. And so there were some partial breakthroughs. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, again, part of the reason they are called brilliant blunders is that these particular blunders actually did lead to significant advances or even breakthroughs, even though the step itself was actually, you know, might have been wrong. For example, one of my examples is Lord Kelvin, who tried to estimate the age of the Earth. And he made a mistake. I mean, and he only got an age that was less than 100 million years, while the age of the Earth is 4.6 billion years. But the ideas that he used to try to estimate the age of the earth were brilliant. I mean, and he really introduced this concept that you can use physics and mathematics to estimate the age of the earth, which, you know, was before that people didn't know how to do that. So, yes, eventually, okay, you know, we today 
we date the earth through radioactive decays and so on. He didn't even know about radioactivity when he did his estimate for the age of the earth. And plus he neglected other processes like convection and so on. But, but the, the fact that he thought even that, aha, I have some physical way to try to determine the age of, of the earth was brilliant and definitely, you know, helped those who came after him. You know, that is such a generalizable lesson for all of us because um, you mentioned in our, you know, private conversation prior to uh, this podcast that um, I come from the world of business and that's not an area that you have invested much, <laughs> you know, of your pursuit of curiosity in. Uh, but, uh, you know, but Dr. Livio, I mean, what you're talking about is so essential to entrepreneurship, to innovation in technology, in science, and in, in business, because this idea of you know partial kind of breakthroughs, you know, of um, you know seeking a certain solution or a certain success in a certain path, and then you know feeling uh, that you actually hit hit upon failure and then pulling back, but then making sure that there are some uh, lessons from it that you have learned, and those lessons are you know, small step advancements you made can be repurposed, uh, if not today, maybe five years, seven years later, when conditions are right, to allow you to ultimately come up with a more complete and um, winning solution. I mean, that's something that I've seen happen in, you know, pharma and in technology and, you know, other, other kind of business pursuits as well. Definitely. And I even mentioned this. I mean, startup companies are a perfect example where you try to take this idea of thinking outside the box or, or, you know, thinking outside the mainstream or thinking unconventionally to get something. And yes, most of those startup companies uh, fail, you know, five years down the road. But some of them lead to real breakthroughs or to real advancements. So uh, indeed, the whole startup concept uh, is built on this idea that at least occasionally you should allow for this, you know, type of thinking which is, uh, you know, to think in unconventional ways. Let's come back to the theme of curiosity and the polymath, the idea of, you know, people investing a time uh, to discover and learn and celebrate, you know, uh, various different disciplines. I see even for you, with how you're otherwise professionally so identified with the field of science and physics, behind you, I see a lot of books uh, on art, you know, Piet Mondrian, El Greco, and others. Um, and so one, one question that I've been kind of, um, you know, noodling on in, in the last uh, few decades is that if you think about the state of uh, knowledge, you know, in a formal sense and, um, you know, scientific, um, you know, understanding, you know, 150 years ago, it was, you know, one might argue, or 300 years ago, it was perhaps a little bit humanly easier to be a polymath because, you know, the knowledge tree had only advanced so much. And as you went through school and college, you know, you could kind of like at some point, you know, get, get pretty far down uh, the line of understanding what's at the frontiers, you know, what's at the frontiers of astronomy or chemistry or what have you. Today, with the explosion of science that has happened over the last hundred odd years, the range of scientific publications out there, the, you know, the machine of science, the enterprise of science happening in so many well-developed universities and great minds and all of that, you know, someone might look at the situation today and say, you know, how can you, how can you compare my situation with a Leonardo da Vinci? You know, he lived at a time when there was very little knowledge. And so he kind of like was able to operate at the top of the game in so many of those disciplines. You know, what would you counsel someone like that who may have that quest or intrigue, but feels intimidated at the advanced state of knowledge that exists in so many fields, which is like, I'll have to spend decades upon decades just to play catch up to those people who were really studying that discipline from a very early age, whereas I've just started to get interested in it now. So you, you're right in many ways, but let me say that in my opinion, there is a place for the polymath even today. And, and let me explain a little bit why. So I, I don't think that we will have today another Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, he, he was unique even for his time. I mean, you know, you mentioned the fact that the knowledge was much less at the time, and, and that's true, uh, but still he was unique even in his time. So it's not as if because there was less knowledge, everybody at that time was a polymath. No, it, it wasn't the case. There were perhaps more polymaths than there are today, but I'm not even sure of that. But here is the thing, because 
of this finding which I mentioned, which is that at the basis of creativity, you need to have this curiosity that that is a necessary condition. And we want to have very creative people. Uh, that means that it pays in a way to be more of a polymath. Maybe not Leonardo da Vinci, but more of a polymath. Now, why do I think that that's still possible today, uh, even though knowledge is so vast? There are several reasons. One is the lifespan today is about twice what it was in Leonardo da Vinci's time, you know, the life expectation. So we live about, you know, the expectation is, is today is, is, is about twice uh, that, both in Italy and in England at the time and so on. So we have more time. Uh, we have more time. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that a lot of information which at that time would have taken a long time to achieve, to acquire that information. Today, you know, we can get it in seconds. I remind you that even printing was only invented, uh, you know, by Gutenberg at, uh, around that time. And printing indeed caused a revolution in terms of just like the internet caused a revolution in our time in, in terms of the ability to disseminate knowledge. But even so, I mean, you know, you had to print books and then transport them and so on. Now, you know, we have at our fingers, uh, you know, either a phone like this or, or a computer and a lot of information for which we have, we would have wasted a lot of time trying to find out, today we find easily. So we can save time on that. So as a result of these two things, I believe that we can still be at some level polymaths. I mean, I'm not saying, again, that we should be another Leonardo. That is virtually impossible today. But we should know more areas and be more aware of more areas than just the very narrow specification uh, that many of us try to do. Okay, I love this. I love this. So what you're saying is that, look, <laughs> compared to people from the past, yes, there is a voluminous you know, amount of greater knowledge and understanding in various disciplines. But on the other hand, A, you're living longer and B, you have like almost instant and comprehensive access to so much information, so much information. Can I throw in a couple of other hypotheses and see what you think of those as to other advantages we have today over past generations to see if that may also help support the idea of like the capacity for us to be polymaths today? So one thing, Dr. Livio, that I'm thinking is that um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this research, but uh, what they're showing is that the IQ levels in society have actually been rising with every passing decade. So from about 100 years ago, when they started to measure this analytic kind of problem solving, you know, measure, right, metric of IQ, that actually the average IQ of people has been going up and up and up. So what they call an IQ of 100 has had to get reset over time because the average keeps going up. That is certain. Let me only just say one thing. I don't mean that everybody should be a polymath. Uh, that is not possible and not even desired. I, I mean, you, you do want to have those specialists who are true specialists in the area in which they work. I mean, they, they definitely contribute a lot. What I'm saying is that sometimes you have, for example, you know, large projects where many people work on. And every person there uh, is an expert in his or her, you know, very, very narrow field and so on. But you, you may want to have in charge of all of this somebody who has, doesn't know all the details of every little thing, but does know enough to see very well the big picture of how things are progressing, you know, and be able to guide these general efforts together. Now, concerning the IQ. Okay, IQ test, you know, first of all, they have their own limitations and so on. But yes, I believe that that, you know, can help. Uh, but also artificial intelligence people tell us that uh, some of them go to the extreme of telling us that within a few decades only, we will have AI machines that will surpass our capabilities in all respects. I mean, we already have AI machines that surpass our capabilities in given areas, you know, like, okay, there is a computer now that 
plays chess way better than the world champion, than Magnus Carlsen, there is now already a computer that plays Go better than the best Go players. But I, I'm talking about, you know, uh, people like Kurzweil and others, you know, who thinks that within a few tens of years, we will have a machine that will really dominate. Now, such machines, in principle, and if indeed this will happen, they have a, a you know a virtually unlimited capacity of knowledge. Uh, so, if they become the dominant species here, then they certainly will be able to be polymaths. Uh, now, again, suppose you don't think it will happen in a few decades, but how about a few centuries or or a few thousands of years? Can you tell me that AI machines will not actually dominate? Now, you know there are questions. Will they have consciousness, uh, the, these machines? And, and here, you know, there is a debate. I mean, there are those who say, okay, if consciousness is, a, is an emergent property, which means once things become complex enough, consciousness necessarily arises, then these machines will indeed become the dominant species. If, on the other hand, consciousness is not something that these machines will ever have, then they will forever be, again, what in the, the AI people are calling zombies, you know. They will, they will do all kinds of things, but they will not really be able to replace us. But I'm just saying that not only in terms of human capacity that is growing, which at some level is limited, because, uh, you know, we have our 86 billion neurons and uh, there, there isn't space <laughs> for much more. So you, we can become a little bit more efficient, but at the end, we are limited with what we can do. But once you're able to, to connect a machine to your brain, uh, then maybe there is no limit to your capacity. It, it can definitely happen. Well, there's much to unpack in what you just said. So, um, you know, you sparked a lot of things, uh, you know, for me to follow up now with some thoughts and questions for you on. So... Coming back to the, you know, the original piece, and then I'll, I'll talk and check in more with you about the uh, future of AI. The idea of, you know, the value of being polymathic, you know, you mentioned that somebody who is the integrator, who is the manager, who is the um, big picture, well-rounded kind of visionary leader to bring the right people together from different disciplines. It sounds like a Robert Oppenheimer kind of like story, you know, when, when, when the atom bomb was created, you know, he, he was playing that kind of a role across different disciplines of the science that was there. I'm also thinking, though, in, in what you've shared in your book on curiosity, that even if you are just going to be a specialized physicist or, uh, you know, biologist or what have you, uh, having, if not necessarily a fully polymathic Leonardo da Vinci-esque kind of, you know, way of life, but having at least a discipline where you take a break from your discipline and uh, go and engage with something, you know, quite, quite different, you know, like, like music or arts can just open your brain up to more kind of flashes of creative insight or something, you know, and so you actually become better at your specialization by having at least some hobby like that. That's one thing that I've, I've, I've sensed from some of your, you know, kind of writing as well. Would you say that? You, you're absolutely right. And I'll, I'll give you actually a perfect example uh, of Galileo Galilei. I, I, my last book was about him. Here, Galileo Galilei had a training as in, in what we would today call the liberal arts. And in fact, he even studied at a school for drawing. Now, when he observed his first observations with the telescope of the moon, he was seeing various things and he started drawing that. But it was his drawing ability and his understanding of light and shadow that led him to understand what he was seeing. You see, he was seeing that it looked as if there were some blemishes on the surface of the moon. But because he understood how light and shadows work, he understood that what that means is that he sees that the surface of the moon is rugged. And he even then tried to estimate the heights of some mountains on the surface of the moon and that there are craters there and so on. At the same time, another astronomer, Harriot in England, also looked at the moon through a telescope. And if you look at what he had, it's just like, you know, squiggles on, on the paper. He, he couldn't quite figure out what that was. So Galileo's training as an artist 
helped him understand the science in this case. So this was a perfect example how the science and the art fed into each other. Oh, what a great example. What a great example. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, with all of us. And, um, you know, for those of us listening in, look, uh, this is uh, the book that Dr. Livio is talking about, um, Galileo and the Science Deniers. It is so rich with so many stories about the enterprise of science and so many lessons that we can learn here about how knowledge advances, how influence and impact, you know, is had in the world. Dr. Olivia, one of the things that uh, was eye-opening for me from the richness of storytelling that you're doing in this book, and kudos, you know, to you for all the heartfelt research you have done to get yourself to a place where you can, in such an informed way, give us this compilation, you know, of that really uh, path-breaking journey of Galileo. Uh, but, but so one of the things that I discover from it is that, like, if you want to be a path, I mean, you know, if you want to be just like, if you want to call it like a formulaic scientist uh, or, you know, that, that's one thing completely within the system. But if you want to do something which is breakthrough, you know, uh, then in some ways it requires you to marshal within yourself certain skills that go beyond just scientific research. You know, for example, he was almost in some ways an entrepreneur in having to think about, okay, <laughs> how do I take this knowledge that I've now discovered about how the earth and its relationship with the universe is a lot different from what the institution you know, thinking is. And how do I actually put it out there? Who are the stakeholders? Who are the influencers? So there is a level of on, almost entrepreneurship he had to show in kind of thinking about all of these different pieces, a level of sort of understanding how to have impact, how to have influence, how to slowly change people's hearts and minds. He's almost like a change maker in that sense, isn't it? Absolutely. And and his entrepreneurship showed that up in even two different areas. On one hand, you see, Galileo did not invent the telescope. The telescope was invented in the Netherlands. But as soon as he heard about the telescope, he immediately understood the power of this tool. And he started building telescopes in his own workshop. You know, it's, it started by taking tubes from an organ and putting lenses on, on the two sides, you know, and polishing his own lenses. And as a result of this, very quickly, you know, the telescopes that were typically available had a power of four, you know, magnification, about four at that time. He very quickly reached a telescope that had a power of more than 20. So on, this was on the technical side. But also on other sides, you, you, you mentioned how, how do you make this knowledge known? Typically, the scientists of the time were publishing their findings in Latin. Now, not everybody read Latin at the time. Galileo insisting on publishing his books in spoken Italian so that everybody will be able to read this. And this is fantastic, you know, that he tried to make his science known to all the people. And in, in this way, you know, he got a much bigger impact. Now, in his particular case, the bigger impact resulted also in not so good things. You know, he was put in trial by the Inquisition, you know, found vehemently suspected of heresy. He spent eight years, uh, last eight years of his life in house arrest. So, but... But nevertheless, he had an impact. So, you know, that's, that's the, the thing. So, so he showed his, his entrepreneurship, you know, even in these different areas. Now, what do you think about the following, Dr. Livio? It's been weighing on my mind that um, we tend to, in education, emphasize the specialized kind of pathway towards learning a lot of physics or learning a lot of chemistry or math or computer science or what have you. But some of these other skills that Galileo had to hone and, you know, and practice in order to ultimately, you know, really leave a mark on history, really build his legacy so that today we look back at him as a real path breaker. Some of those things, you know, some people may self-discover or learn through their life experience or just have in their nature or something, but they're not necessarily formally part of training people into how do you become like, you know, a, the, the most uh, exemplary 
practitioner of your discipline. And so, what do you think about the idea that in training somebody in a bachelor's or master's or PhD in in physics or math or something, that they're also taught some of these kinds of capacities? I think that this is not for everybody. It is not clear to me whether or not putting this formally into the education system is going right. to work well in the sense that uh, for some people this may not be the best way. You know, in some sense, what you would like to happen, and unfortunately doesn't always happen, you would like to give that type of education already at the high school level, if you want, you know, mm-hmm. so that people have the broader view there already, so that when they choose to go into something, you know, they already have some of that. Some of the bachelor programs in universities try to fill the gaps that were left from from high school, but yeah. maybe not sufficiently, you know. So, yes, I mean, I like that, but I don't think it will work for every person. I have been speculating in the last three minutes about the... Um value and potential of bringing a little bit more humanistic education, you know, the practicalities of working in a messy world into science. But there's also the opposite of that, which is bringing a little bit more of scientific, um, you know, uh, thinking into, you know, everybody's life, you know, to make all of us in some ways more disciplined in our pursuit of truth. And to that end, There is, you know, one of my favorite stories of the year, Dr. Livio, I am a story collector. I love stumbling into great new stories and adding it to my repertoire and offering offering these from time to time in my classes and conversations. And so one of my favorite stories that I've discovered this year is from you. And, you know, while you have shared in across all your books, you know, just so many stories of some of these great eminent scientists, the story that I'm referring to the central character in that story is your daughter, your youngest daughter. <laughs> and it's the lipstick story. Would you, would you be open to sharing that with our listeners? She agreed that I would share that story. I actually, you know, it happens to my own daughter, but I think it's a wonderful story in itself. Almost all parents experience the fact that at some point, the school asks the students to do a science project. I'm talking here, you know, in middle school or high school that they're supposed to do a science project. In most cases, unfortunately, that becomes a project for the parents. <laughs> the, parents <laughs> the parents choose the project. This is, this is from what I've seen, you know, from friends and, 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 and other Absolutely. I, I, I've had the same situation happen with me. My daughter corralled me and, you know, <laughs> captured me in a room and made me work on this physics experiment with her. Yeah. So, so it, you know, it becomes a project for the parents. And w- when my youngest daughter got this project, uh, she was supposed to choose a project. And I, as a physicist, suggested all kinds of experiments. You know, I suggested to measure the free fall acceleration in a variety of ways, using a pendulum, using an inclined plane, using this, that, and whatnot. She found all of that incredibly boring, (laughs) all of those experiments which I suggested. So I told her, okay, you know what? You think of an experiment and, and, and let's see what happens. And she came back with an exper- with a sug- following suggested experiments. There were at the time aggressive advertising on TV from of the lipsticks of a certain company, which claimed that these lipsticks are the most resistant to kissing. That you know, you put that lipstick, uh, you know, it holds even through many many kissings. Now. My daughter didn't care about lipstick. She wasn't using lipstick at the time. But she cared about the truth in advertising of this. So she told me she wants to study which lipstick can resist most kisses. Once she decided on the topic, then we did help the parents, you know, in terms of thinking how to do that. And again, she had the idea, but, you know, we we helped. For example... She thought, okay, how would we know that? She would put on the lipstick, try to kiss, you know, a a piece of paper, a very thin piece of paper many times. 
And if we could somehow weigh that paper with many lips, different lipsticks, very accurately, you, this would tell us which one, you know, the lipstick residue remained on the paper. Uh, well, it so happened that my wife is a microbiologist. She had this very, very, very precise analytic balance in, in her lab. So we did that. My, uh, my daughter, you know, kissed this piece of paper and we weighed that very, very accurately, and uh, we managed to do that. Similarly, she had the idea if we could measure, if she would kiss a transparent piece of plastic, and if we could measure, you know, the transparency of that. And again, we found an instrument that you can pass light through it and determine the transparency. And at the end of the day, and you know, when she studied like these 10 different lipsticks and discovered, believe it or not, that actually the advertising of that company was correct. <laughs> they, they had the most resistant <laughs> lipstick to kissing. But the whole idea, you see, first of all, that she wanted to decide on the topic. And also mm. she had the idea of how to try to do that. I thought that was uh, really phenomenal, actually. I think that should get the, uh, the award for the most original Formulation of a scientific question. <laughs> Did get first prize for for it. Ah, yeah, there you go, there you go. Deservedly so. Amazing, how oh, beautiful. So, you know, on the same theme of curiosity and knowledge seeking, I was very uh, fascinated by one of your other observations of what Cheek um, Sent Me High has discovered about um, what uh, is at the core, the essence of, you know, people who are very curious. And you talk there about how they tend to be people who entertain and embrace a lot of complexity, you know, like a multitude, you know, on the one hand, they're engaging in great physical activity, but also with frequent periods of quiet and rest, you know, responsibility, but also irresponsibility. Uh, alternating between imagination and fantasy on the one hand, as you say, and then a rooted sense of reality on on the other extroversion, introversion, even even both masculine and what you might call feminine qualities, you know, in them. That's fascinating to me, uh, Dr. Livio. Now let me make a connection with business. In my work, you know, I went from just the traditional trappings of you know from from math to business, but ultimately, like you, got curious about curiosity. I got very curious about human potential and how it can be harnessed more in, in the world. And so I went ahead and did a lot of studies of uh, some of these very story, great like lives, you know, over the course of history, the change makers, the social and business leaders who have, you know, left like a luminous, you know, imprint on humanity. Uh, and then also, you know, some of the latest psychotherapy and neuroscience and psychology and what can be learned from these disciplines uh, and, you know, collect all of that knowledge together for leadership. I, I mentioned this in, in, in my first book, you know, I, I've just written one, it just came out in a mastery outer impact, that uh, what I discovered is that a leader, if you really have to, in a sustainable way, do, do good things, you have to learn to be everything and the complete opposite, you know, from the outside, sometimes assertive, sometimes agreeable, sometimes introverted, sometimes extroverted, sometimes visionary, sometimes very pragmatic, etc. So when I saw that, it seems to relate so much to what I've discovered about the outer aspect of being a leader. We can come back and talk about the inner aspect, but the outer aspect was so close to what you just described, a, a quality of that, you know, holding multitudes within you. Can you speak to that a little bit? I, I'd love, you know, I'd love your thoughts on that. I don't think I can add much to what uh, Chixen Mihai already discovered, but I, right. I also found that fascinating and that that these people seem to have in them this what he calls complexity uh, that you, you know maybe most of us uh, you know we have a certain range for any given characteristic uh, that is perhaps somewhat limited and that those people who have been very very curious very creative actually have a much wider range of of those qualities uh, indeed, going, you know, all the way from sometimes being introvert to sometimes being extrovert. Uh, and even this business of masculine, feminine. Uh, well, we know, for example, that uh, many of the, you know, greats of in history have been gays and even well, some that we don't know uh, for sure. I mean, but, you know, we suspect that may, that may have been the case. So, again, a very broad range, you know, on one hand had to behave like male, on the other, you know, uh, uh, more like female. So, yes, I, I think that that is 
probably part of this business. In some ways, it is, is the same as, as curiosity, in that curiosity also tells you that you should be interested in this and in that and in this and in that and in this and in that. And this complexity also says that in terms of your characteristics and behavior, you should also have a relatively wide range in these characteristics. So I, I think that this is all part of the same thing, which we probably don't have the right word for, uh, you know, to describe, but this combines this curiosity with complexity. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. You you have such a knack for extracting really thought-provoking uh, quotes from some of these people you've studied. And there's one from Leonardo da Vinci that just sparked me. I mean, it, it was amazing because I, I thought about the potential for that to be, in fact, a guiding light for us in today's time when we're seeing so much painful polarization in society. And this is this quote, uh, Dr. Livio, where, where he, he says, nothing can be loved or hated until it is first understood. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, <laughs> of course. You know, I, um, I also coined the phrase uh, in, in that book about curiosity and uh, the phrase that I'm quite proud of, although I later discovered that I'm not the first who invented it, was uh, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, I discovered later that uh, actually an art festival in Copenhagen used a very similar quote right. uh, for, you know, as, as a banner for their uh, thing. Now, what do I actually mean by that? Very often, things we are afraid of are things right. that we know very little about or don't understand. And if we actually bothered to learn more about them, we would be less afraid of them. It's very easy, for example, I, I, I'll give an example. I don't want to become political, but I, I'm giving this not as a political example, but as, as, as right. a general example. If some world leader you know, says, refugees, they're all terrorists, and I don't know what, okay? Then it's very easy for you to say, oh, terrorists, then I don't want them, and so on. If you start getting into that, you know, you very quickly discover that it is not possible that this 75-year-old woman who carried her three-year-old granddaughter, you know, with her across boundaries, uh, across borders of countries and so on, it's not possible that she's a terrorist or her granddaughter is a terrorist. But there is a big human tragedy behind all of this. And then you become much more less afraid and more sympathetic to the whole thing. And Leonardo, you know, understood that. You, you have to first understand what it is. And to understand that, you need to do it through curiosity. You know, he also said, ignorance can, can blind us, uh, open your eyes, which is in a way the same thing. Yes, you have to open your eyes to see all these things. And, and then uh, you, you are less afraid and also, you know, have a better understanding of whether this is something that you should praise or not, uh, and so on. But you cannot make these judgments before you have been curious enough to know more about these things. Yeah, I, I just think there's such a powerful antidote in what you're saying to some of today's, um, you know, dysfunctional dynamics, whether it's in Congress or in, in society more broadly. You've talked about how fear can get overcome at times, you know, through that curiosity. But also in your last uh, phrase, you talked about judgment, you know, at times being premature, uh, you know, until one has actually fully discovered hatred, judgment, fear. I, I'll give you a story, you know, on that. Uh, so a few years ago, I was blessed to go to Robben Island to get to experience what it must have been like, you know, for Nelson Mandela, you know, when he was there for 20 odd years in prison. And what I uh, learned, you know, uh, when I was there is that, um, you know, some of the prison prisoners, uh, they observed the following dynamic that um, by virtue of just the exposure 
that the white prison guards got to them, you know, the, the black African National Congress, you know, uh, anti-apartheid fighters, the, the exposure that the white prison guards got to them got to open the white prison guard to the fact like, hey, we, we, we've just been brainwashed about how these are inferior people, you know, bad people and all of that. They're actually just like us. And then as a result of that, the black uh, prisoners themselves went through a transformation of their own where they started to see like, oh, wow, you know, these people are not evil. They're not all actually very dismissive and condescending of us. It just so happens that they have been taught and trained and, you know, given a certain kind of, you know, way of thinking about us. And now that they're exposed to us, they're actually starting to behave in a very different way. So this idea that just the, the mutual exposure and the new kind of deeper understanding of like the true selves, you know, that it, it uh, led to, made those judgments and, uh, you know, those, those divisions kind of just melt away. Yeah, it's, this is a very good, good example, I think, yes. Now, of course, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not claiming uh, that there is no evil in the world or there are no, right. there, are, there are attempts to suppress curiosity, yes? I mean, we know right. this very well. I mean, a famous story, of course, is this young woman, Malala Yousafzai, right, who was shot by the yeah. Taliban in the head just because she advocated education for young girls. So, you know, basically she advocated, you know, the importance of curiosity and, and of study. And uh, she was shot in the head. Luckily, she, she survived and, uh, you know, it continues to be an activist for, for education, for girls and, and so on. But th this is a perfect example of suppression of curiosity. Uh, similarly, you know, the Nazi regime, you know, had this uh, uh, exhibit of degenerate art, which they called where they sort of grouped all the famous artists, uh, well, not all, but many of the famous artists of the 20th century uh, did this exhibit and then, you know, provoked uh, people there to shout against that art and, and so on. So it's not just against science. It can be against the arts. It can be against anything, really. Again, you know, the Taliban dynamited these huge statues, which, you know, existed for many hundreds, thousands of years, actually, and, and they dynamited them. This type of, of suppression of curiosity is, is truly devastating to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you for sharing those examples. And, um, you know, as you were doing that, I was starting to reflect on our own modern society, you know, our own place here in America, for instance, and, uh, you know, these echo chambers and social media, the, um, you know, some of the risks of cancel culture, you know, where we um, quickly get very intolerant of um, even uh, being open to a reasoned debate, you know, on, on a certain topic with uh, somebody who takes a different position from us or who wants to challenge some part or whatever it is that we, in a well-intentioned way, feel we are trying to do to either preserve a certain tradition or to disrupt and open the world up to a new way of thinking about social justice or what have you. It's, uh, you know, there is at the root of it, I think a little bit of that, that incuriosity, that lack of curiosity, that is uh, resisting, uh, making people resist, um, you know, the idea of looking for more nuanced solutions. This is why I coined that phrase, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. So in our final sort of moment, uh, you know, of our conversation uh, today, so Clifford, I, I want to go back to uh, one or two of the themes that you've been speaking about and that I want to just like explore what it might look like if we were to push the boundaries there a little bit, <laughs> since a, a lot of your work is about, you know, the pushing of boundaries, right? That incrementally happens or sometimes in big breakthrough moments in science. So the, you know, one model of the human brain, you know, of the uh, creative capacities of the human brain is that it is sort of like a computer. It has a CPU, a processing unit, and it has a hard drive. And then you pump a lot of information in it by reading a lot of books, interviewing people, having life experiences and what have you. So you pump all this information into it. And then the CPU helps you to do the processing through which you come up with new inferences, new hypotheses, new ideas. And then there is another way to think about the brain, which is that actually speaking, that computer has not just a hard drive and a CPU. It also has a browser. And that there is a world wide web, if you want to call it, of like cosmic intelligence in the universe. And it already exists. It's out there. 
It's just that we have to burrow through and find like our channel, our path towards intuiting it, towards grasping it, towards channeling it, towards bringing it, you know, from some other dimension onto the space of cognition and, uh, and, and physical material manifestation. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think of that? It's something I'm very drawn to coming from my more mystical and transcendence oriented interests. Um, actually, you know, given your, your keen interest in, in the arts, I have been fascinated to read some accounts of Brahms and Tennyson and Puccini talking about how, you know, they didn't actually create what they created they just uh, got into a state of flow where the symphony just came to them or that, you know, that other piece of like that aria, you know, for Puccini just like came to him. And they were convinced that it was, you know, it was this thing that was out there in the universe, you know, uh, you know for some of them with the spiritual beliefs, they might associate it with God, that this was kind of God basically channeling something through them. So um, when you talk about AI, for instance, and, and whether at some point it can actually outdo us, that certainly makes sense when you think about it only in terms of a CPU and a hard drive. But, um, but then with this browser aspect, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's where humanity will always have one leg, one leg up over, um, over the AI kind of machine that we have out there. But it's a provocative idea, not, not one that is easily amenable to like physical instrumentation based scientific um, proofs or investigations. Uh, curious about your thoughts. Let me tell you, while you have been talking, uh, this actually reminded me very well of, you know, that there is a big debate which has been going on for centuries about whether or not mathematics is invented or discovered. So the two kind of basic schools of thoughts here say there are many mathematicians, philosophers, and so on that say, that mathematics is discovered, that mathematics is out there, all its truths are out there, and we only discover those truths in the same way that we discover a new galaxy that we have not seen before. Uh, this is called, you know, the platonic view of mathematics, because all the mathematical truths are in this platonic world of mathematical forms. The second view says that, no, mathematics is invented by the human brain. Uh, it has no existence outside the human brain. We actually invent all of this. My personal view, and this will apply to what you say, is that mathematics is actually an intricate combination of both, in the sense that we invent the concepts, but then we discover the relations or theorems, if you like, among these concepts. For example, uh, just to give a short example, you know, in mathematics, there was no square root of negative numbers. There's no square root of minus one, okay? There is no such thing. But at some point, mathematicians tried to discover, to, to solve equations of the third degree, and they discovered that for some solutions, they, as an intermediate step, they had to go through square root of negative numbers. So basically, they kind of invented a new concept, which, you know, today the square root of minus one, we call it i, it's an imaginary number. And we, they invented these numbers. They did not exist. I mean, you know, they just invented them. You know, that, that's for that, I call that i, okay? But once they invented these imaginary and complex numbers, they discovered a whole host of theorems about complex numbers and also how complex numbers can be used in electric circuits, in quantum mechanics, in this and in that. All of those were discoveries. Once the concepts were invented and a certain rule, a few rules invented to apply to them, the rest, we had no control over this. Those theorems were there. In this sense, in, in my opinion, and not just my opinion, there are others who think this way. Uh, there are those right. who are convinced it's invented. There are those who are convinced it's discovered. There are those who think like me that it's a combination of inventions and, and discoveries. So in your example, I think that it's probably a combination of the two things that you uh, described. Uh, that's at least uh, my yeah. humble opinion.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And that was a great example that you gave of complex numbers to illustrate what you were just saying. You know, the last thought on that uh, to test with you, I, I didn't discover that yet. You know, I haven't been able to go through every part of your writing. So maybe it is there somewhere. But, um, you know, I've, I've also been very intrigued about how it has been observed that there are certain periods in the history of the advancement of science where sometimes uh, two or three or you know multiple people in different parts of the world who were not communicating with each other of course that's harder today where everybody's communicating with everyone instantly almost but in in, in past centuries there have been documented cases of people who are, weren't communicating but who ended up developing very similar mathematics or very similar just around the same period of time almost as if there was i mean the way i think about it you know is that of course maybe it was the case that science had just come to that tipping point and so it was natural for somebody to actually help push it over that tipping point. That would be a very logical way of thinking about it. Or could there be another way of thinking about it as well, which is that if this was already out there somewhere in the ether and maybe human consciousness was just rising to that point where it was starting to open itself up to tuning into that kind of higher truth. And so therefore, you know, some people were able to, you know, kind of figure that out. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts on that? <laughs> Well, I, I think, again, it's a combination of the things you just mentioned. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it would certainly had to be that the knowledge prior to that had to get to a certain point in both places. Right. Because it's, it's, it's rare where things are, you know, completely not in the air and, and uh, you know, and, and invented. There are a few such cases. But those usually involve only one individual and not two. I mean, when right. something is not in the air, when it is kind of in the air, then it is very often the case that people in different places, you know, come to the same type of conclusions and same type of discoveries. Dr. Livio, I'm going to close out by sharing one quick story with you and then inviting you to just offer from your side, what is it that today you are most curious about? What is it that at this uh, stage of your luminous career, you are most uh, getting invested in, into, into the next chapter that you're seeking to write uh, with all the prolific contributions you already made, both to science and then to the advancement of public understanding of that science. Uh, so, but as you think through that, I, I just wanted to kind of offer up this one story to you. Since you've given me such a beautiful story about your daughter, and this is one about my daughter. <laughs> you know, we have one child and she's a daughter. And at some stage early in her life, we saw her struggling a little bit of time management. She was in her single digit years. She was not even 10 that time. And I felt like, you know, maybe I should sit her down and offer her a little bit of a life lesson. So I did. And I said, Manami, you're going to have to choose at some point, you know, a certain path for yourself in life. And you may have to leave some other things on the side in order to be able to fully do that. You may not be able to stretch yourself so thin that you can do everything because, you know, these hard choices have to be made because that was what was happening with the time management issue across all her areas of interest. And, and then she looked at me and said, but Leonardo da Vinci didn't have to choose, you know, and I was stumped. I was stumped. I was like, you know, who knows what force there is within this little child and who am I to limit it by, you know, putting pre, pre, you know, preconceived notions of how much we can or cannot accomplish or do and fast forward to today. And she is a college, you know, going, you know, a teenager and she is majoring both in history and in math, you know, at the same time. And has a strong interest in many languages, learning many languages and all that. She's certainly vastly exceeded anything that I would have imagined that, you know, she would she would have been doing and, and certainly vastly beyond my own capacity to, um, to to learn learn a wide range of disciplines. So it's been a very humbling, you know, personal personal moment for me. And to answer yeah. your question, my current yeah. passion is about life. And by that I mean mm -hmm. origin of life on earth and whether there is life elsewhere. Well, I wouldn't say in the cosmos because we would not find it very far away, but in our own galaxy, whether we can find life, either simple life or complex, intelligent, in quotation marks, life in our own uh, galaxy. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I I'm very happy that you are doing this because I think this... Uh, this serves a very, very good purpose, you know, for educating uh, many people.